Hello folks, it's Dr. Christine Sauer here, and today we are talking about, again, the anatomy and physiology of our digestive system. So last time we talked about the overview, now we are getting a little bit more in the nitty-gritty. So today it is part one, we are talking about head and throat. Now, who doesn't have a head and throat? Uh, we all do, of course. And I warn you before we go on, there will be a few images that some people find a little upsetting. If that's you, use your discretion, close your eyes, or over, uh, uh, skip that part of the video. Now, we, uh, the digestive system, as we said last time, is responsible for taking whole foods and turning them into energy and nutrients. And that allows the body to function, to grow, and to repair itself. And we need this for all things in life, including our brain health and mental health, which is one of my most important interest areas. Now, without a well-functioning digestive system, our mental health and brain health cannot function. Now, let's talk about the six primary processes of our digestive system. And they include, number one, the ingestion, the taking in of the food, what we conventionally call eating. Number second, the secretion of fluids and digestive enzymes. And we'll get more into the details of that. Then the mixing and movement of food and waste through the body. So basically what happens between the mouth and the anus, the digestion of food into smaller pieces, because what we eat has to be broken down and proteins have to be broken down to be able to be used in the body. And we'll talk about all the details of that later the absorption of nutrients, because even if you eat the best foods, they get mixed properly and digested. If it's not absorbed into the body, into the bloodstream and reaches the areas, the little cells where it's actually used, all the goodness is useless. And then part six is the excretion of waste, which is a nice name to call elimination or pooping, peeing and similar things. We'll talk about all these issues later. Now let's talk a little bit about definitions. What really is anatomy? What it means is we're talking about the structure of the body, where things are in relation to each other. Then there's physiology, the function of things, how it works together, how the biochemistry and how it works in normal life when everything works well. Now, then there's an area of medicine called pathology, which is what can happen when things go wrong, the signs of diseases. And we'll talk briefly about some of the most common diseases of the area that we are talking about. So let's get right into it and look at the anatomy and physiology first, and then I'll get into the most common diseases towards the end. The anatomy, you all have probably seen an x-ray. This is an x-ray of the skull. This is a side x-ray. And this is an x-ray from the front. And this is just from the other side. Now here, this is a big skull. And in, in here is a cranium where the brain is. And you can see here the spine and the different spine uh, vertebra. You see here the mandible and the teeth, the nose would be here, the eyes would be here. This is the front, the forehead, this is the back of the head. And when you look from the front, you see this is the top of the head, this is the chin, and it's all a little bit over on top of each other. But what you see here in the middle, those little black areas that look a little bit like cauliflower, those are sinus cavities that are on top of the eyes, and there are some here in the middle <laughs> next to the nose and the, eye, uh, and the, uh, the eyes. So they are hard to see. I understand that. And we'll go a little bit more into it. Now, if you ever use a chiropractor and I absolutely recommend it, there may be a skeleton or even in a hospital or a doctor's office. And part of the skeleton is, of course, a skull, a mandible, the jaw, upper jaw, the teeth, and also the spinal column. 
Now, our spinal column hopefully is not as straight as this, uh, <laughs> uh, this spine here in the skeleton. Of course, this is a plastic skeleton, not a real person. And in reality, that is a little bit curved. And we need a little bit curving for the normal function of our spine. And I know my chiropractor could say so much more about it. But uh, generally speaking, if we keep our spinal uh, alignment and curves proper, the nervous function function better, the fluid circulate better, and the whole body functions better. And we'll talk about the nervous system as it affects the gut health a little later too. Now, let's go back to the skull. And here's a skull projected into a head. So you see here the nose. And the nose really in humans has no bone. It has cartilage, which makes it stiff. But it's not like in some animals that it's really bony. So the bone starts here at the end, at the bridge of the nose where your glasses would sit. There's the nostrils, the mouth, the lips, the teeth. This is a lower jaw. And you see here how it hinges in the skull right here in front of the ear. And you can actually, when you stick a finger in the ear canal and you open your mouth, you can feel the jaw joint moving. This is your lower jaw joint moving. And you can feel that jaw joint right in front of your ear here. And it's quite interesting to try that. Now, there's a bone that goes across that makes our cheekbones stand out a little bit. And when that breaks, it's very uncomfortable, obviously. And the skull itself is made out of different bones that you can see here in a schematic view. Now, in babies, those sutures are actually open. They do not fully close until at one or two years of age. And that is necessary in evolution to be able to for humans to have a relatively big head and still being born out of the birth canal of a woman without killing the woman in the process. So the head gets quite tightly squeezed at birth and then it can expand and actually the brain grows and the head grows for a year or two. And then at age six or so, it's fully grown and not the brain itself. It still develops until age 25 in women or 28 in men. Now, all those bones have fancy names. You don't necessarily need to know them. Okay, let's go on. So when you look at the skull again, and then you put a layer of muscles on the upper head, that's what it would look when you peel the skin off the person, which we normally, of course, don't do. But there's a lot of very interesting muscles uh, surrounding our head and uh, our body. And uh, it's very fascinating actually during medical school to learn about all these. And they allow us to have those very differentiated facial expressions. For example, these muscles allow us to squeeze the eyes shut. Here is a lot of muscles that allow us to smile, frown, make a fish mouth. <laughs> or smile from ear to ear. And it is very interesting how that works. I won't go very uh, uh, detailed in it because this is not medical school, but interesting uh, are muscles like here that innovate the, uh, the jaw and allow you to chew. And they're a little bit lower uh, below those layers. There are several layers of muscles, one on top of each other. It's quite fascinating. Then here's muscles of the head and neck. And you notice when you turn your neck to the right or left, you notice these muscles, they stand out quite well. They have a wonderful, complicated name. They're called Stanocleidomastoideas. At least that was in German. All right. I still struggle with uh, pronouncing Latin names in English, but that's okay. You'll uh, see what I mean. And if not, you can look it up. Uh, okay, here we have what's happening on top of those muscles of layers, because of course, it's not just muscles that we have, there's much more going on in our body. And it's fascinating. There's blood vessels, veins, arteries, and yellow here are the nerves. And there's uh, salivary glands. There's a very important one here in front of the ear. There's one under your jaw. And there is several ones and they are important. And actually, when something happens with the parotid, uh, parotid gland here in front of the ear, 
uh, there's a very important nerve that goes here. It's called the trigeminal nerve. And it can actually get paralyzed and you have a droopy mouth and a droopy eye when that happens. So there's a lot that can go wrong, but most of the time, isn't it amazing how much goes right? <laughs> All righty. Now, when you look at uh, cutting the head a little bit more open, <laughs> now I invite you to follow me a little bit in. We go to the brain and I'm looking forward to do a complete anatomy, physiology and pathology class about the brain as it pertains to uh, brain health and mental health in the future. Because it's such a fascinating topic to make it accessible to normal people like you and me. Well, maybe I'm not that normal, but that's good. I'm sure you are. Now, the brain, of course, is in the skull and in the purpose of gut health. We don't talk too much about the brain, except that it takes about 20% of the oxygen and nutrients of the body, although it is just 1% of the body weight. That means it's extremely metabolically active. And a lot of the oxygen, the, the, the breathing, the air you breathe need, is needed by the brain. And a lot of the nutrients is needed by the brain. And if you don't nourish your brain properly, your brain health declines and your mental health declines as well. And we'll go more into that. Now, an interesting part of the brain that I always like to point out is here the olfactory bulb, which is the smelling organ of the body. The sense of smell is located, as we know, in the nose. And it's uh, actually very little tiny nerves that are mostly on top of the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is bigger than most of us think. It's not just the nostrils. It's a whole thing here and it's connected to the mouth. And that's important because when we eat something and taste it, we usually at the same time smell it. Isn't that interesting? So the, there's not just taste receptors, taste nerves in the tongue, but at the same time, what's in the air that surrounds the food, and there's where the smell of baking cookies comes in, that's especially enticing. You taste the cookie, you smell the smell of the warm cookies here with these nerves, and the olfactory bulb is a nerve that transmits it to the brain. And the sense of smell, interestingly, is the only sense that directly reaches our emotional centers in the brain. And that's why sometimes smells have the strongest emotion associated with them. And it's, it, I, I go more into that when we talk about the brain, but it's fascinating what's going on in the body and how it goes together. Now, for digestion, of course, the nose is important for the smell, because if we can't smell and taste our food, why would we eat it? We might feel hungry, but we just wolf down whatever. And the sense of smell and the sense of taste have been developed to help us distinguish between food that is edible and food that we better not eat. For example, you can easily taste when a food is rotten. That's important. Somebody that can't taste might not notice, especially when they don't watch it or see it. Now, for animals, the senses, of course, are very different from ours in part. For example, we know that dogs can smell so much better than us uh, and that certain animals can see much, much faster or better than us. So it is always adapted to what the species needs most, and nature usually makes it very efficient. And that's a true miracle how that works together. All right, now the tongue is really a big muscle. It's not just a flap of skin that's in your mouth, it's a muscle. It's one of the biggest and strongest muscles in your head and neck area. Now, the jawbone we heard about, the trachea is the windpipe, and behind the trachea is the esophagus, and we'll get more into it. And you all have experienced that when we, say, hastily swallow something and try to speak at the same time, that something goes in the wrong tube and we start coughing. And that can happen when food that we swallow goes into our windpipe instead of our food pipe. Now, why is not all our food going either in the windpipe or food pipe? Because as you see, they're right close together. They have a common funnel going through it. Well, 
has a trick to it, and the trick is called epiglottis, which is a very tricky little uh, flap of cartilage that when we swallow, closes off the windpipe and prevents the food that we want to swallow from going in the windpipe and instead directs it into the food pipe, the esophagus. Now, let's have a little closer look on how that works and start with the nasal cavity and have a little presentation that's a lot of fun to watch. So the heating air, the blood vessels lining the nasal cavity warm the air before they get into the respiratory tract. And the air gets humidified and the lining is moist and that helps moisten the air. And then we filter the air with those little hairs that we see in the nose. So they have a purpose. They're filtered out. And so the mosquitoes don't get breathed in or not too many. And mucus and par small particles and larger dust particles get filtered out. So it all has a purpose. And let me just look. I think I have a cute little one about the epiglossus that I just mentioned about that little flap. And I mentioned what happened when we swallowed. Let's have a look at that. So let's see how that function, because when we swallow food, the epiglottis closes over the opening over the trachea and prevents food from being lodged in your trachea and causing you to choke. Let's watch that again. See that epiglottis is closing. The food comes in the tongue, goes down, and down it goes the right way, it's closed. Let's do that again, it's closing. The food comes in the mouth, up the tongue, back, closed, right tube. So that's how it should work. Now, hopefully that's how it works most of the time for all of us, because it's quite unpleasant when the food constantly goes in the wrong tube. It can happen after stroke, for example. And then sometimes you need either surgery or feeding tube to help you avoid that. Now, then, of course, we have what we know as the oral cavity. And we all have looked inside our own mouth and saw that here, the ovula. That's where the tonsils are. If they are enlarged, you can see them big time. And there's a tongue. And there's the teeth framing it, and it is all lined by what's called epithelium, and the saliva glands keep it moist. Now let's talk about how all this works, because it's great to look at it, but how does it really work? Now what is really digestion? Let's define the digestion. It is the process of turning large pieces of food into its component chemicals. Now, normally we don't swallow a whole bread. We first chew it, but we don't always chew it to very liquid consistency. And that's okay, because unless you have certain illnesses, because we have two processes in digestion, mechanical digestion and the chemical digestion. And let's talk about both, and both will be addressed in this course. Now, the mechanical digestion is a physical breakdown of large pieces of food into smaller pieces. Now, that, of course, begins with the chewing of the food by the teeth and, this, and, the, and the, uh, the tongue and is continued through the muscular mixing of food by the stomach and the intestines. Now, you all know if you have no teeth, it's hard to chew. And that can look cause digestive issues. Now there's also bile that's produced by the liver and that's also used to mechanically break fats into smaller globules. That's also still mechanical digestion. And while the food is being mechanically digested, and that's important to break it down in smallest pieces possible, so it can then be attacked by the enzymes and the other chemicals that we produce, and that's called chemical digestion. And that means that the larger and more complex chemical molecules are being broken down into smaller molecules that are easier to absorb. And sometimes it also means that only when that takes place, 
do we have the nutrients that we need? Here's an example. When we eat proteins like meat and cheese and, 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 and yogurt or milk and stuff like that, nuts or soy or whatever protein source we choose. And we can talk about that in nutrition class a little more. What happens is that the protein in your stomach gets broken down in smaller proteins. And then it needs acid and certain enzymes to be broken down further in the amino acid that we actually can absorb. And so if you have no acid in the stomach, which is a common condition, we talk about it in the stomach series, it doesn't get properly broken down in amino acids. Now you need to know that amino acids in turn are the precursor of neurotransmitters or feel-good hormones. See the correlation? No acid, no feel good. Easy. Ah, and there's ways to help that. Now, chemical digestion, again, begins in the mouth. Who thought about it? With the salivary amylase. By saliva, splitting complex carbohydrates into simple carbohydrates. Now, saliva is a wonderful fluid we'll talk about in another slide. But you know, when you eat, for example, white bread and you chew it for two, three times, it starts turning sweet. And that's why the complex carbohydrates in bread called amylase are broken down by the enzymes amylase in your saliva into simple carbohydrates or sugars. There we go. So the enzymes and acid in the stomach, they continue the chemical digestion but the bulk of the chemical digestion actually takes place in the small intestine, thanks to the action of the pancreas gland. And we'll talk about that in another episode. And the pancreas gland secretes an incredibly strong digestive cocktail. It's known as pancreatic juice, and that is capable of digesting lipids, fats, carbohydrates, starches, proteins, and nucleic acids, which are the breakdowns of cell nucleus and the in, inner parts of cells. Now, and now you can imagine why if your pancreas is inflamed and it basically digests itself, why that would be incredibly painful. It basically means you digest yourself from the inside out. Now, that is an emergency for sure. By the time that the food has left the duodenum, it has been then the small intestine, we'll talk about that in a future episode, it has been reduced to its chemical building blocks, fatty acids, amino acids, monosaccharides, which are sugars, and nucleotides, which are mostly amino acid and smaller components. And we'll talk about that in the metabolism part of the course. Looking forward to that one. Now let's go a little bit more in the anatomy of the tongue. Because each little organ and each little part of the body is wondrous, a miracle. It's magic how that functions. <laughs> Don't you see that? And we have, for example, here's a tongue. This is a part that we can see, the tip of the tongue and the back of the tongue. And when you look closely at the back of your tongue, you see it looks like cobblestones. And those are all lymphatic tissue. So you don't have all only the tonsils on the side of the mouth that sometimes have to be removed when they get chronically inflamed. But there's also lymphatic tissue or tonsils at the back of the tongue. And that's how important it is because when we eat something, usually there's some uh, contamination with viruses, bacteria, with parasites, and with fungi and with other organisms. And if everything works well, the saliva that had antibacterial, antiviral properties, together with the lymphatic tissue that is the first line of defense, gets rid of it before it can do us any harm. So no worries, our body is prepared for the onslaught of infectious agents from the environment. And most of the time, it is able to handle them very well. And at the end is the epiglottis. And this was a little cartilage flap that closes off the windpipe when we swallow so the food doesn't go in our lungs, but in the stomach where it should go. Now the sense of taste is in those little 
nerve endings that are embedded in the tongue. And that is a whole other chapter that I'm not talking about today because it's quite complicated. Let me know if you want to hear something about that and I can make an extra lesson about that later. Now, the teeth are very important because in our modern society and even in history, they often broke down through wear and tear or through onslaught of acids that are often produced by bacterial plaque. Now, the teeth are meant to withstand a lot of assault. They are the hardest organs in the body. The enamel is the hardest part. The dentin inside is softer. And each of the teeth has a little pulp chamber with nerves and blood vessels. So that's when you have a toothache. That means that something has arrived through the hard substance, through the dentin, and has arrived inside here. That could be just a little inflammation and the dentist can easily fix it or it could be serious like an abscess that can actually destroy the whole bone down here and lead to a chronic infection that can influence your immune system in a negative way. Now, we all have the teeth arranged in a certain way and dentists study that in their dentistry stool for a, for a long time, they know all about it way more than I ever know. What's interesting is that you have different kinds of teeth as humans, and not all animals have that a kind of variety of teeth. We have here the incisors that are meant to cut those stuff. We have the canines, just four of them, that are meant to rip bone tear out of meat. And then we have molars that are meant to chew chew like plant materials. And it's interesting to note that, for example, obligatory plant eater like cows have only molars because they chew all day and never are meant to eat meat. And uh, animal eaters like this little uh, cat here, they have mostly canines. See all those pointed uh, teeth? That is a canine teeth here. And here you see a cow's mouth and you see the difference. This is meant to chew grass all day and we chew it. This is meant to rip out meat. So what does it say about humans? Well, we are omnivores. We are meant to eat whatever comes in front of us, meat and plant food combined to our fullest benefit which is very versatile, obviously. Now let's talk about saliva facts. We each normally produce one to one and a half liters a quart of saliva, which is about four to six cups, if you want to go in cups. And every day we secrete it even while we sleep. And the pH, the acidity, is around 6.35 to 6.85, so slightly acidic, but not much. So it helps actually to keep our mouth clean. The saliva actually contains about 95% water. Most of it is water, but the rest are ions. And ions are chemically polarized atoms that like bicarbonate and phosphate, they're acting as buffers. So if you drink a Coke, it's very acidic. Your saliva starts to buffer it so it doesn't attack your body. It also contains glycoproteins, which are proteins and, uh, and, uh, and, and sugars combined. They are often used by the immune system to recognize that. They contain enzymes like amylase, lysozyme, and it's, which is antimicrobial. They also contain mucus, which makes it a little uh, uh, less liquid. So it sticks to your mouth and doesn't just run out all the time. It contains IgA, which is part of the uh, immediate immune system to keep our invaders at bay. It also contains epidermal growth factor. So it helps heal. And there's where the saying comes from, a mother's kiss can heal the wound. Well, I wouldn't take it too literally unless uh, your mother's mouth is completely clean and healing and you have no other ways to heal the wound. <laughs> Modern medicine has helped us there a little bit. But actually, it is some, there's, there's a lot of truth in those ancient sayings. 
let's talk a little bit more from the mouth, <laughs> with the mouth from the mouth. Of course, we use it to talk, to form sentences, to speak, and it's a complex interaction of the brain and the muscles in the face and the tongue muscles that allow us to form sentences, speech, and talk. It's quite complicated. And that's why when somebody gets dangerous, they have to learn to speak. For a few days, it is weird. <laughs> I know that. I have partials. <laughs> now, then there's stress. Many of us are stressed. And stress means sympathetic nervous stimulation. And that reduces saliva production. That's where the dry mouth comes in. When you're afraid, your mouth dries out. The same for dehydration. If you don't drink enough, your saliva dries out. In both cases, it's not good for your teeth and your mouth and your immune system. So stress is bad for the immune system for many reasons. I'll talk about that even more. But one of them is that your mouth dries out and it's no longer possible to defend yourself right away against the onslaught of organisms. Now, many medications also reduce the saliva production, and that is an unfortunate side effect. So if that's for the case for your medication, you might want to talk with your family doctor if it has a negative effect and if the medications are really important. Now, then there's teeth facts. We all usually have two sets of teeth. There's 20 baby teeth. We are not born with it. They usually break out around one year of age. And we have 32 permanent teeth. Now, some of us, they lose a few. Some of us, the wisdom teeth, uh, they're called wisdom teeth because they come the latest. And hopefully by then, when they come, we are wise. There, the name is coming from. Then we have the eight incisors, as I said, for cutting into food, for cuspids or canines, they're pointed to pierce meat and tough foods, and eight premolars and 12 molars to crush and mash food. So we are very well equipped for the mechanical digestion part. Now let's look a little bit more into the anatomy in a summary before we go on and talk about what makes us sick and then lead on to part two for next week. Here's again a cut, a model cut, of course, it's a plastic model to the middle of our head. Here's a nose at the front, the mouth, the lips, the chin. This would be a part of the shoulder. This is the back of the head, right? And here's the brain, the gray matter. This is the little brain, the cerebellum. And this is the middle of the brain where the two halves are connected, the brain stem, and here where it goes in the spinal column. Now, here's the sinuses. They're mostly in the midline, but also on both sides of the midline. And the nose cavity and the nasal cavity is pretty big and leads into the windpipe here. And the windpipe has cartilage rings to keep it open. And here's the food pipe behind it. And it's a muscular pipe. And we'll talk about the food pipe or esophagus next week. Now, then here's the epiglottis. The epiglottis actually has, is the one that closes off when we swallow. And what happens when we swallow? We eat here the teeth, they chew it, and then the tongue propels it and puts it together with the other muscles of the cheeks into the food pipe and leads it slowly to the stomach. Now, here's another schematic issue that we can see the uh, nasal cavity and the mouth even better and how it hangs together. The yellow part is the windpipe where the food is not belong. The white one here is the epiglottis. And you remember how it can close here on this. And then the food goes down the red way, hopefully, and that ends up in the stomach. Now, let's talk a little bit about what can happen when things go wrong in the head and neck area. Now, here are common diseases of mouth and throat. And uh, I'm not even talking about the diseases of the nervous system or the very rare ones. Now, number one, of course, we all know halitosis, bad breath. Then very common tonsillitis and pharyngitis inflammation. 
The third is carious and gingivitis. And of course, dry mouth is very common, serostomia. Herpes, we all know fever blisters are cold sores. Then there's canker sores or arthrosis stomatitis. And then we know maybe have heard of anaphylaxis or angioedema. And I'm not going too much into that, that I talked about that in the food allergy part, uh, it happens with uh, other allergies too. It is when uh, angioedema is when, for example, your lips, but also your tongue and throat can swell grotesquely and so much that you cannot breathe anymore. This is an absolute emergency. You have to go get medical help and maybe even have a tube down your throat so you can continue to breathe while the swelling subsides and they treat your allergy. Now, halitosis, let's talk about bad breath and offensive odor. We all are afraid of it. <laughs> Do I smell bad? <laughs> I know. It's very common and it affects about one third of the population. So if you feel you have it, you are definitely not alone. And about nine out of 10 of those individuals that tend to have bad breath, the underlying problem lies within the mouth and the condition is termed intraoral halitosis. Now those medical terms are terrible, aren't they? And it's primarily caused by oral bacteria and they produce foul smelling gases. They call volatile sulfur compounds, VSCs. And you know the rotten egg smell, that is one of the most common ones. And uh, yes, you can do something about it with common mouthwash <laughs> and to change the oral bacteria into better one. There's actually oral probiotic lozenges that you can, uh, can suck on and that help with that too. Now the other 10% are classified as extra oral halitosis because the problem is outside of the mouth. And the most common cause of that uh, can be medical diseases, liver disease, kidney disease, uh, stomach, gastrointestinal problems, or even the adverse effects of medication. Those all can cause bad breath. Now, what about tonsillitis and Laryngitis. It's an inflammation of the lymphatic tissues in the back of the neck. And the lymphatic tissue, when it functions well, it tries to defend you and it actually does it very efficiently against bad germs. And if we don't have a lymphatic tissue and an immune system, we can't survive. And you might have heard the story of uh, unfortunate children that have been born without an immune system and have to live in an artificial bubble. And uh, thankfully in our modern medicine, sometimes we can do a bone marrow transplant and give them uh, somebody else's immune system so they can get out of their bubble of sterile environment. And uh, inflammation of the lymphatic tissue in the head and neck are often caused most often by viruses like the common cold, we all know the sore throat, or by bacteria like strep throat or diphtheria. Those are more serious diseases that can lead, if untreated, to side effects, heart disease, kidney disease, not just scarlatina. So those need to be treated. So that's why it's important if you may have bacterial uh, tonsillitis that you see your physician and if you test positive for strep throat or if it is serious, you have a high fever for more than three days, you'd feel really miserable. You have the typical look of the, the white strips in your tonsils. The, the doctor will give you antibiotics to take for 10 days. And it's important to take them for the full 10 days because if you stop too early, what happens is the bacteria get resistant and they come back. Now there's a case that's called chronic tonsillitis when the tonsils get infected with bacteria or viruses over and over and over. When that happens, the lymphatic tissue actually becomes the seat of little abscesses that you often cannot see. And those can actually be what's called a focal infection that happens to engage your immune system unnecessarily all the time. And in effect, it will weaken your immune system or it can change its balance from the normal functioning to a balance out of whack. 
and out of that can mean either that you are very susceptible to infections or that it overregulates and you get an autoimmune disease and you don't want either. So if you have chronic tonsillitis, then it's also time to talk with your doctor and the tonsils can be removed without the, 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 the big ones, if they, if they are the, the cause of it, without long-term side effects. If they are affected negatively and affect your health negatively, that is a good thing. Normally, the tonsils are very valuable and I would not remove them without good cause. Now, dental cavities. Oh my God, they are so common. Even the cavemen had them. Caries and gingivitis tooth decay and associated infections commonly contribute to halitosis, to the bad breath. And what are causes of dental cavities? Just ask your dentist or dental hygienist. They tell you all the time, brush your teeth, insufficient oral hygiene. Now, overbrushing is also not good. You can actually brush your teeth away and then cause tooth decay by overbrushing. So have it a golden middle. Talk to your dentist, dental hygienist about what's best for you. Now, the bacteria composition in your mouth, the oral microbiome is also very important. And that is often neglected because what you eat plays a role for your microbiome, not just in the gut, but also in the mouth and in other parts of the body. Because our body overall, that amazing miracle is meant to function together with bacteria and viruses and fungi and parasites in our environment. We function better if we have some the right kind around us and with us. It's weird sounding. Some people find it yucky, but it's a sad truth. We need our little bugs. <laughs> There's actually 10 times more uh, bacteria and other bugs in us and around us than we have cells, our own cells in the body. We need those to function properly and for our immune system to function properly. Now, in the mouth, what can we do? Of course, don't overdo the mouthwash. Eat healthy foods. We can talk about that another time. And if needed, take those uh, oral lozenges that contain probiotics to help restore it. Then, of course, composition and amount of your saliva also plays an important role for dental cavities. Because if your mouth is extremely dry, it is more likely that the teeth go out easily. And then when you eat a lot of sugary food, that is a problem because unhealthy bacteria like the sugar, they multiply like crazy every 20 minutes, and then they produce acids. And those acids can erode the teeth. So that's another point not to eat a lot of sugary food. And once you do it, bath your teeth afterwards. And I know my mother already took, told me, so it's really not telling you anything new to tell you, but I just wanted to explain you why that makes sense and why it is actually a, a good thing to do. If you choose to eat sugary food, candy, chocolate, brush your teeth afterwards after the good taste is gone and the serotonin high caused by them. Ah, dry mouth. There we go. Serostomia is a medical term. That means when an inadequate amount of saliva, the clearing of the food particles is more difficult. You have trouble swallowing because it's not smooth and soft enough. It gets stuck on the teeth. It feels uncomfortable and eventually it dries out the skin too much. Uh, it can be very, very dangerous for overall health to overdo it if it's severe. Now, causes can be uh, autoimmune diseases like surgeons, I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Uh, it's, a, it's a syndrome where uh, all the, uh, the, the glands basically shrivel up. Your mouth shrivels up, looks like a tobacco mouth, and it often goes along with other autoimmune diseases like scleroderma. They are not as rare as we think here. In, I live in Nova Scotia because the world is much bigger and it happens. I've seen many, many of those cases in Germany as a dermatologist. Uh, medication side effects are, I think, the most common cause of dry mouth nowadays. 
especially when people get older, they think it's old age, but most often it's not really the old age, it's medication side effects. Then of course, if you breathe through the mouth for whatever reason, it could be a habit, it could be that your nose is clogged uh, and you either have a cold or you have uh, polyps in your nose and that should be looked after if it's a polyps. If it's a cold, you can take natural medicines to heal it faster or prevent it. And uh, uh, that can be helped. But if it happens every now and then, it's not a big deal. If it's all the case, especially in children that start to snore, you should talk with your doctor and find out the issue because for children it can also impact the speech development because the mouth and the nose develop differently whether you breathe normally through the nose or you breathe all the time through the mouth. No, no, no. Sometimes we all breathe through the mouth. When you run at your fastest speed, you can't breathe enough fast enough through your nose. You have to also breathe through the mouth, and that's fine. But it's about all the time breathing through the mouth is not healthy. If you can avoid it, try to do so. Then a very, very common illness, herpes simplex, fever, blisters, cold sores. Very interesting because it's actually a virus. It's a herpes virus. And we also know the genital herpes, which is a different virus, by the way, most of the time. But they're the same family, and they have one interesting characteristic, the same as herpes zoster or shingles. It's also a herpes virus. They all have one characteristic. They tend to, after the first infection that can be pretty nasty, they tend to live in your nervous cells in the back, in your spine, forever. And whenever your immune system is lowered, for example, you have a cold, that's where the name comes from. You have a fever. Your immune system is busy with other things. They, they take their chains and multiply and cause a few nasty blisters. Now, normally it's quite harmless. If somebody is severely immunocompromised, that can be a real problem. Thankfully, nowadays, we also have medication that can help with that. Now, you might have heard of canker sores, of mouth sores, or hopefully not have them too many, but many people that have them after stomatitis or after ulcers, they're extremely painful. They are very small, oval-shaped ulcers. They are on the inside of the mouth. And when you pull off your lip, you can see them. They're red, white, or yellowish in color. They're usually harmless, but very painful. And they heal on their own in a couple of weeks. They can heal faster if you put certain uh, uh, tinctures on it, like mirror tincture worked very well when I was a dermatologist. That's what I usually prescribe. Uh, they can be caused by pressure of dentures or braces. If that's the case, the dentures or braces should be changed or adjusted so that doesn't happen. And when they come recurrent, and do not heal easily, it may be a sign of other diseases, such as Crohn's disease, celiac disease, vitamin deficiency, or other illnesses. So if you have them chronic, they should be always checked out. Now that's the end of today. I hope you enjoyed that little excursion in the head and neck, anatomy, physiology, and a little tiny bit of pathology or diseases. Next time, we'll talk about esophagus, the swallowing pipe or food pipe and about our stomach. And I can't wait to do that and I'll see you there. That's it for today. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.